Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Epic Sketch Time. My name is Mark Monlux and I live in Tacoma, Washington. I work as a freelance illustrator and you can find me on any social media portal underneath Mark Monlux. Uh, with me today are Bill Morris and Ian and oh my god Ian I was just about to mangle your last name. How do you pronounce your last name? It's, it's Castrita. Castrica. Yeah. Okay. That was not what I was going to say. <laughs> so, I have a, That's an easy way to, to get around that. Anyway, Bill, why don't you tell people uh, where you are and what you do? Hi, I'm Bill Morris. I'm in Seattle and I'm a freelance illustrator and cartoonist. And in my free time, I work on a comic strip called Rhapsodies, which you'll see in the address on the doodly do. Hey everybody, my name is Ian Castrita. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can find my stuff at unfedartist.com. Uh, for all my social media, it's Unfed Art. And uh, yeah, I'm an illustrator, graphic designer, and cartoonist working out of Arizona. So let's see, I'm going to be working on my tablet today because uh, I'm doing a logo. Um, this is what I call an as-is logo, nor, where the client's budget is not as high as I want it to be, so they have, they're they going to have to be uh, happy with it as it's presented. There's not going to be any alterations or additional work on it. Um, but I actually allowed them to take a look at the rough sketch because uh, I wanted to ask them whether or not they wanted slippers or barefoot since one of the things they wanted was to have it. Um, sometimes I get very interesting descriptions and uh, the logo form looks nothing like the description. Uh, in this case, okay, uh, she looks a little bit like the description, but one of the key words was hygienic. Wow, okay. <laughs> Uh, let me, uh, I rarely hear that in modern parlance. Well, it's for, a, it's a, it's for the food industry. She wants Okay, to, that makes a bit more sense. I generally, uh, associate the word with milk. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, uh, I'm trying to pull up her Facebook. Uh, she was also giving me a very short description. We haven't talked on the phone because, you know, Apparently there's no budget to talk on the phone. Uh, let me find this. And she's more of a fan of my artwork around town. So let me see if I can find her. Yes, here she is. And her request was for me to uh, do, do, do. First, she asked for another uh, artist friend of mine, some last year, and uh, well, let's see. She's drawing fruit this year and would like to find a cartoon that fits the fiber fairy. Uh, this would be used on uh, her labels and on a business site and eventually on Facebook. And she wants, so she basically wanted a cartoon. Very, very, uh, let's see. Uh, she was imagining a plump and funny cartoon fairy with funny wings. Does that help? Because I was trying to ask her to describe. Uh, she also saying, can you put some purple streaks in the, ha in the hair? And then, uh, then I was trying to get her to give me more details. Uh, long hair, no hat, a wand in her hand, a positive expression that she's cheerful. She can also be dressed in hippie garb. She is promoting dried fruit, so she has to look sanitary and health conscious. Will that work? And I wrote back, hippie garb to me is bell bottoms and pleasant blouses with a headband. 
if that's not the look, let me know more with specific details. But she wrote back saying that that sounded just fine to her. So this is my rough sketch. Ah. Uh. A uh, very... The, the specs that I you listed made me think she was going for something a bit more Rubenesque, but... Yeah, I originally I was thinking Rubenesque, but when I was thinking of... Uh, uh, we were kind of going with a uh, sort of like the 70s hippie chick vibe mm -hmm. and this is the basically what i felt comfortable drawing so but she liked it so i'm going to be doing a final on it now cool so what are you guys working on well, i'm working on a sunday strip i'm and I've been making pretty good progress on it. Just a second. Uh, I, oh, need uh, to be let in to show it. <laughs> oh, my apologies. Let me fix that button. Okay, Bill, now try it. Okay, so here's where I am so far. I didn't think you normally did Sunday strips. Generally, it's uh, it's when I have. Generally, when it's when I think of them, I've been wanting to try and do more. In this case, it's whenever I think I, the story that I'm working on is not fitting into the uh, five week format. So, and I've been sort of been and since the iPad has been doing wonders with my speed. They don't, aren't quite as much of a time sink as they used to be. Mm -hmm. You just did a Sunday strip, right? Uh, I, I could have sworn I saw one. Yeah, yes, yes, I did. Okay. So anyway, I... So uh, how's this for a... Uh guys see the sketch okay yeah okay are you did you put the camera on your head mark what? I, I put it in the color of my shirt <laughs> <laughs> let's <Okay>. repair it <laughs> yeah. there we go yeah you'll be able to see more of it than normal at least it's better than the top of my head <laughs> So, uh, and Ian, what are you working on? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm working on a comic that I procrastinated on this month and, uh, I, I've made a goal of getting out this week before the end of the month. So we'll see how that happens. But, but yeah, as usual, I bit off more than I could chew and, uh, not with this comic, but with other things. And, uh, I kept on putting this off. So I, I apologize for that. I really did want to get this done sooner, but, uh, but yeah, it seems like the more you finish, the more you have to do. And, uh, I, I can't remember. Um, I think there's an episode of Malcolm in the middle, um, where, uh, the father, he's like, he goes to like, uh, get something out of the closet and there's like a, a broken light bulb in the closet. So he goes to find out like a, a spare light bulb and the shelf that the light bulbs are on is creaky. So he, he goes to find a screwdriver uh, and uh, like goes into the uh, the garage and he, he finds a leak and then uh, he like, he needs to get, get supplies from the hardware store and the car kind of stutters when he, <laughs> he jumps into the car. And so he goes underneath the hood to fix the car and his, and his wife shows up and it's like, hey, the light bulbs out. <laughs> and he's like, I know, I'm trying to fix it. <laughs> It seems like that's my life lately. I just, 
uh, I, I thought I was going to be kind of free after I did the, uh, the update to the website. And it turned out, I was like, oh man, I have so much more to do because of the website. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, not to mention like still trying to stay on top of actually, you know, making comics and all that stuff. So, um, you know, it's, I guess it's good to be busy, but at the same time, I'm not really being paid for any of this. This is all like self-initiated stuff. So, mm. Well, I'm hoping that uh, I'll be able to show you guys some book illustrations I'm doing for a client. But uh, until the book's published, it's, you know, mum's the word, right? Right. So, but it's still pretty cool, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's, it's a it's a really fun book project too. And it's all thanks to my uh, deck of playing cards. No kidding. Yeah, he uh, he. I met him through a professional organization uh, where uh, we were. Yeah, uh, where I'm more really known for my whiteboard videos and stuff, and I'm sketch noting. But at the convention, I happened to bring along a bunch of my decks of cards, and he bought one of the decks of cards, and he's just been really enjoying it. And then he got this idea for a book, and you uh, thought, you know, Mark would be perfect for this book, and. So just when I was getting almost done with this other project, um, a video project, which I thought was done, but which the client, you know, you would, you would expect something to be done once the storyboard was over and you finish off all the files and you sent the files off to the videographer and you send them to her so that she can just, you know, rub, you know basically stamp, put a, uh, an okay stamp on them, right? Mm -hmm. but she's seeing things that she wants to have change. And since we're not doing it through a video scribe, but through the videographer, she knows that we can do a little bit of a alterations. And uh, uh, and she knows that she can actually get some changes done. And so there's this one scene now that we're on scene uh, version number seven. And I'm kind of going, oh man, I'm being paid by the hour. So I'm not terribly worried about that. Do you generally take uh, hourly work? Oh, I've been doing it more and more. Really? Uh, but it's, when I do hourly, it's a full rights buyout at 200. Okay. And, uh, basically I found that a lot of clients want to buy full rights. And if I just charge heavy to begin with, they don't mind. So they'll, they'll just pay, you know, they'd rather have full rights buyout. <clears throat> I used to, I spent years and years negotiating on behalf of the client against myself saying, okay, he only really needs one time usage rights. He only needs this and this. And so I would try to sell them that package thinking, okay, let's go for the most affordable thing. And then about uh, 15 years ago, halfway through my career, I realized this is a terrible idea. Why am I negotiating on the client should be doing their own negotiation. And I just switched over to saying, okay, what, what would be a full rights package so that I don't have to worry about being nervous about reuse or any of this thing? What would make me happy? How much money? And that's when I started uh, charging a day rate of 2000 and uh, an hourly rate of 200. And it's worked out really well. I've, uh, I have to say I'm pretty happy I'm not getting a bunch of uh, 
residual little checks for reuses anymore. On the other hand, so that's a bit of a, a letdown, but the type of work I've been doing doesn't really lend itself to reuse. Uh, like I did this one illustration some years ago that was basically a smiling sunny face. And over the years, I've resold that. The first time I sold it was for a one-time use for the Shenland County Tourism Board for the inside of a national brochure they did. And I got hmm, about $600 for it. But by selling the reuse of that image to both now, first shout, they came back and said, hey, we'd like to have a reuse fee of this next month. And then the designer who used that piece of art said, hey, I'd like to use that for something else. And I said, okay. And the licensing just kept going and going and going. And I made uh, not quite $20,000 off of it, but somewhere between fifteen dollars and $20,000. And that's supposed to be like the goal, right? Like you, you make artwork, you keep most of the rights, and then you find ways to resell it. But you're saying that that became kind of a um, a burden or or just obnoxious well, to you. I I was noticing that with the change in the industry, with the internet, everybody was taking for granted that they were going to get everything. Huh. And I thought, you know, if they're just going to have that attitude from the get go. Uh, why not just why not just put forward the uh, the budget for it initially? And uh, I was really surprised that the clients I was working with, nearly all of them were corporate level at that point, and uh, they didn't flinch. And so it just yeah it it was an easy way now i'm not saying that all my clients were that way but the more a majority of them were enough that uh you'll still get a client that'll th i love having a client just reel with sticker shock and then so i can't pay that and then you negotiate down rather than trying to negotiate up when the client says oh but i want to use it for this and this and this they don't want they don't like the idea of having to pay more money in a negotiation, but they love the idea of paying less money in a negotiation. Yeah, that makes sense. And I just was angry with myself for not realizing that so many years, for so many years. And it's because I had the typical artist mentality of, oh, I want to be a nice guy. And, uh, You can be a nice guy in business. You just have to make a profit. Sure. But, yeah, on, I, I'm a, but on this logo, I am not making a profit on this logo. Are you losing money? Oh, I am so losing money on this logo. Yeah. I, I am paying, she's not paying me nearly enough, but uh, sometimes you do jobs for sweet old ladies mm -hmm. or you have a feeling about something that it's going to come back and uh, be beneficial to you later on somehow. Like this is a gal who's pretty heavy in the fine arts community in Tacoma. So, and my name is getting known more and more in this community as a person to go to. So if I can, now I don't want it to be uh, known as a person to, to go to to get a cheap logo. That's yeah. not it. But I also, I was just kind of weighing the thing 
of, uh, I think the, the positive on this will actually outweigh the negative. I know it sounds like I'm saying, oh, this, is, this will be good exposure for me, but it's not exposure. I'm getting the exposure. It's sort of like uh, a reputation as someone who's willing to work within the industry. Yeah, yeah this is very unusual for me to take this. I almost said no to this project. Yeah, I still need to figure out my uh, my whole uh, sales persona or whatever. Like I, as far as like my pricing goes, like I, I know what my expenses are and I know what my minimum rate should be. But, um, but yeah, they're like everybody and their grandma has been telling me to, to charge flat rate, never charge hourly. It's like, it, it, it's been like this mantra that's been pushed at me for like the past couple of years, I'd say where everybody's like, why are you charging hourly? That's, that's terrible. And meanwhile, it's like my only client right now is hourly. And I, I like that because they ask for so many alterations and it's not that big a deal, right? Because it's like, all right, it's your money. Um, and, and I also have like really clear guidelines on my availability. So they understand that at a certain point, they can't just ask for stuff. They have to realize that they're gonna pay more because I'm not available. And it, it's worked out, it's worked out uh, pretty well for me, but I, every other client I go to, I, I present flat rate, right? And I get the sticker shock. I get the, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm getting pretty good at hearing it over the phone now, right? <laughs> this is like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll contact you later after we talk to some other people. I was like, sure you will. <laughs> 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 but but I, I actually wouldn't mind doing hourly just as long as I got a decent deposit, um, you know, on the front end. So, so uh, I, how much are know. you how much are you charging on the hourly uh so my minimum rate uh I'm just like airing my laundry right now but let's see my my minimum rate right now uh i'm i'm aiming for 150 but uh but yeah if they were to do a full rate a uh, full rights buyout like you I, i'd probably just say okay well that's 200 but uh, but now having him listen to you, I'd probably start at 200 and say, well, if you don't want to have full rights, I can go down. Um, but uh, yeah, my, my minimum rush rate is 300. So like, if they're like, oh, we needed this yesterday. It's like, okay, well, if you want to pay me rush, I'll lose some sleep, but you know, you'll be paying me well enough that I won't mind it. Um, and it's this juggle act too, right? It's like, well, I have other clients. I can't just shove them under the door because you have a problem all of a sudden. So, uh, you know, if, if you're willing to, to, to pay more for the, uh, the convenience of getting this done quickly or whatever, you know, I'll, I'll do the rush. Uh, but yeah, I, I have the spreadsheet. It has all my expenses. It tells me, it tells me how much I should charge, uh, for retainers. And then I actually, built out like additional spreadsheets best based on my my previous projects where I know like oh it takes me this long to do sketches and this long to do inking and if they want color uh, the flats take approximately this long and I can get that flat rate quote right and and so and so I you know I spit out that number and yeah the sticker shock so I I don't know I I would uh I think I what I'm gonna try to do is hit them with the hourly rate next time but say you know it'll be this much deposit on the front end and see how that flies um well one of the things that i've been doing to you know i've charged a larger amount of money right i'll let them know how much the project's going to be and it's and if i'm not making 200 dollars an hour i know i'm not making i'm not going to make a profit on it um one of the things I do is uh, to get the larger budgets for those people who have sticker sh shocks is uh, I explain that they, I do I arrange payment plans for them. And that's been working out really well. And how do you figure that out? Like, cause, cause there's always the risk that they just won't pay. Right. There. Ah, but here's the thing. 
there is the risk that they won't pay. But what you do is it's not, I'm going to put my camera back on top of my, it's falling out of my pocket. Ah. <laughs> so I have, let's say I have a, a client and they're doing, I've, I had this one client and he was having me do, do a book, uh, doing, start off with book illustrations and then it went into me actually designing the book for him. And uh, I was actually giving him, when I started that project, I was like so dead in the water. I was, I went with uh, only $150 an hour rather than $200 an hour. For full, right? Uh, yeah, because it was for a, uh, a book. Well, actually, okay. And uh, <clears throat> and they were the type of illustrations I did not mind giving away. They, they were basically technical illustrations and side profiles of people with bad posture. I was never going to resell these books, I mean, these images again. Okay. So I didn't mind. Uh, but what I did was I had, um, at first we started off with 50% of the invoice would be paid on 30 day net. And the, and the other remainder part would then be put onto a tab it's for the payment point. schedule. But initially, the first invoice, everything was 30-day net. The payment agreement is a secondary document. And if the client fails on the secondary document, you have the first document to fall back on. If they break the payment schedule contract, everything's immediately due, plus they have no rights to any of the work that you've, that you've uh, done for them because they haven't paid for the licensing on it. Yeah. And so you have them sign a, uh, you have them agree to an immediate cease and desist with a separate or uh, agreement saying, okay, basically if you, I mail this to you, you're agreeing that uh, you can't use any of this stuff and you're agreeing to that right now. And so they sign that and that really puts the onus on them to make the payments because what are they going to do? They're going to have all this product or, or these items with their stuff. And if they can't sell it, then uh, they're going to really be out more money because a lot of people, they'll take your thing and then use it and make money anyway. So uh, where was I? The way I work, work it with my clients is I'll start with uh, either $50 or $100 a month if they have a, a, a credit line of me, say, between $1,000 to $2,000. I'm in no rush to get this money so long as I get a small check every month. Hmm. Now, what happens is that that client will come back to me and ask me to do more work. This client kept revising his book. So his buffer kept getting bigger and bigger, or his line of credit with me kept getting larger and larger. And every time it did, I would increase the amount of his monthly payment. It went from $50 to $100 to $150 to $200 because his line of credit with me went from 2000 to 4000 to $6,000. I was in no rush to get that $6,000, you know, hmm. $200 a month. This is how I completely broke out of my feast to fam famine syndrome. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I had like, you know, anywhere between two or four checks coming in a month that would definitely cover all the big bills that I had in my life. I mean, it would cover the mortgage or what have you. So, and it left in the meantime, I was also getting that little bit of net 
amount from each project. So I'm getting more than just the uh, the payment schedule money. I'm also getting, you know, like maybe 20% or 25% of whatever the, the project was initially. Right. I'd be getting that on net 30. So, I, I've so sold, you said you made a like a original contract? You have your original contract. Okay. And that, that has your fee and everything based in it. Right. And it has everything. But it doesn't in, have a payment structure? No, no, on no, no. It does have a payment structure. The okay. payment structure is net 30. A lot of people forget that you can have more than one contract piled on top of another contract. You can modify the agreement with a secondary agreement. So okay. the secondary agreement would say, okay, and my payments contract is very vicious. I mean, there's tremendous penalties if you're late, but the thing is, Uh, one of the things in that contract is that all those payments would be paid automatically via the bank. And anyone can go into, like you could go into your bank account and say, oh, write so-and-so a check on the first of every month. Okay. When I first started doing this, uh, you couldn't. You'd have to actually write a check. And I had this one client, I did a beer label for him. He called me up because his check was late. And he... And he says, Mark, Mark, I forgot to send it. Can I still use the material? I said, yeah, just send me the, the late fee. I think my late fee was like another $150. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, him having to make double the normal payment. But he paid it off. And that was for a $1,000 bill label. I mean, beer label. Yeah, I only got $1,000 for a beer label. Yeah. But, uh, so... So the secondary document that you have, it, it basically says that uh, you and the client are agreeing to a, to a payment plan in lieu of the, the original agreement. And then if, it, if it's not, default it's on the not, payment it's plan? not in lieu of the original agreement, it's just a payment plan. Okay. Okay. Because if they mess up or if they, if they break that second contract, the first I can, instantly activate the first contract and the first and and have everything become immediately past due and hit them with late payments for the whole nine yards so did you draft this yourself or did you have a lawyer help oh you? i drafted myself it's easy really? you don't need lawyers to draw up this stuff yeah I, i'm trying to think of how i do it in my head and it's just it's it's giving me a headache. So, <laughs> well, if you want me to send you over my uh, agreement sometime, it's it's the payment agreement is really simple. It's just one page. Mm -hmm. and it's easy to understand. Uh, it has a you know a couple of penalties. It says, hey, this is what happened. You know, it, it basically covers all the points I talked to. I don't think there's more than twelve points in the entire contract. Yeah. You know, I'd like to see a, a webinar on this whole thing. Like, I mean, everything you said is, is, is like definitely on topic for me because it's like I said, I'm, I'm trying to, to struggle with the, uh, you know, getting a, a client to jump on board and, and, and say, yeah, let's pay you. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, basically what you're saying is like, you've, you've made it less of a, uh, what's the word? You've, you've taken the sting out of getting paid for for the client, right? And uh, you know that that's super super interesting to me. Like I, I I'd love to find out more. But yeah, I mean, if there if there is something you want to share, by all means, uh, you know, I'd be happy to take take a look at it. Yeah, because I I had I had my original agreement um, that uh, Katie Lane from Work Made from Hire helped me with. And, uh, and I was pretty happy with that. And then I, uh, I did a, a legal audit of my business and, uh, the, uh, the lawyer down here in Arizona was a, a mergers and, uh, you know, whatever corporation lawyer. And <clears throat> he, uh, he, he offered to, you know, take, take some of the language, but make it more, uh, ironclad, if you will, you know, uh, like 
cut out, uh, basically make it more legal ease where, where Katie right. was like nice and inviting and you're like, oh, I can understand this. Like the, the new contract is like, it's like, holy cow, this is an intimidating document, you know, but I was, I was happy with it because, you know, I, I don't really want to have problems. I, I want the contract to take care of everything in the front. So, um, well, you know, that intimidating language can be a problem. Um, yeah. Like there's, uh, I tell the story that I was contacted by the, uh, the Bellevue Athletic Club. Okay. By the designer there. And she said, Mark, uh, can we hire you to look at this contract? I said, what, you don't want to hire a lawyer? Oh, we've had lawyers look at this. And they say it's an okay contract, but we don't understand it. Right, yeah. And I said, can you, uh, I said, well, I'm just a cartoonist. Said, no, no, can, can you look at this for us? I said, okay. And uh, so I went over the various points, it, it was a boilerplate contract and it was for some uh, software company that would be handling their membership because the Bellevue Athletic Club is, Bill can tell you that Bellevue is sort of like uh, the ritzy town next to uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. It's where old, I used to live there and it's the type of place you dress up if you go to the mall. You know, oh, really? <laughs> and uh, or you mean like suit and tie, or oh, well, you, you, you all those shirts. It's very Republican. Oh, it's, okay. well, it's just people have money there. It's where all the people from Microsoft live. You know, if you got right. money, you live in Bellevue. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> it's sort of like a commuter's drive. A, uh, across some long bridges to get to Seattle. So when I was looking at this contract, I thought, okay, the best way you can do look at a contract is not just point out the faults in the contract, but to offer in negotiation an alternative. And so I would point out a fault and say, okay, uh, this is why this language is difficult. Can we go with this alternative? I think it says the same thing, but it's a kinder, gentler way of interfacing. And uh, I and I sent my report back to the people at the Bellevue Athletic Club, and they said, "Oh, Mark, this is great. This is really comprehensive." Oh, I'm I'm really glad you like that. You know, I think I charged them like two hundred bucks for writing this evaluation because I spent like an hour on it. But this was back when I was still charging only $100 an hour uh, for my stuff. Uh, I was living in Ballard. This is a uh, early 90s. Mm, before it was a yuppie place. Well, it was still a yuppie place. But uh, Let's see, what was I saying? Anyway, then they said, uh, Mark, we'd like to hire you again. I said, what, what for this time? And they said, well, it's not for illustration. We want you to negotiate this contract. I said, really? I said, yeah, what, can you call these guys up and just talk it through and negotiate out these points? And I said, sure, I'd be willing to do that. And I get on the horn with the, the other people and I walk through and they agreed with all my points. And at the end of it, they said, you know, we want to thank you. I said, this is the other company, right? The one that had the contract. And I said, why is that? Uh, they said, well, we are almost wanting to pay you for your time because you have made, we've been having a hard time selling this contract to our customers. But with these changes, we'll be able to use this, this contract that we're going to be using this new language that you came up with. I went, Oh, well, that's great. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, yeah, pay me. <laughs> the problem was that sometimes when you use a lawyer, the lawyer 
all lawyers are on the offensive. All lawyers want that they're, they're obligated to do the very best for their client and leave yeah. no loopholes. Yeah, yeah. The, the problem with that is that, uh, like you said, it can be extremely intimidating and they, uh, their business was suffering as a result. Yeah, I mean, my, like I said, I, I like I like the contract because it, it's so ironclad and and just like it's it's a it's a strong document. But uh, yeah, I, I I just know that you know some some would look at it like me and, and just uh, I, I probably wouldn't have as hard a time as other people. But you know, some would look at it and just not even bother reading it, which is a bad thing in my opinion. I, I mean it. If, if somebody says, oh, yeah, they're barely, they're not even going to take a look at the contract, it's like, well, that, that contract defines the relationship in many ways. It's important that they understand it. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't want that. But by that same token, uh, one of my other networking groups this past month, uh, they were talking about how they've had trouble dealing with client delays. And I said, well, why, why isn't this already addressed in your contract? Because I, I have provisions in my contract that, that covered uh, delays and how, like, if a client doesn't give feedback in a, an appropriate amount of time, uh, I can have the authority to put a project on hold and uh, negate all the milestones and the deadlines. And if they come back to me, we have to come up with new timelines because, you know, I'm, I have other things to do. I can't wait for them. And they need to understand that. And so, I mean, that's, that's in the contract, right? And, and I, I shared that language with them. And I, I, was, I was very specific uh, about telling them, it's like, you know, I still want you guys to talk to a lawyer because one of the things I understand is, is a lot of people uh, make Frankenstein contracts where they get pieces and bits from other contracts and they try to make a contract out of it but you can actually negate an entire legal document because it'll have conflicting language or it'll have vague language. Um, and anyway, I, I mean, I was like, you know, take this as inspiration, but don't take it and just plug it in your agreements. You need to, you need to make sure you, you talk to a lawyer and make sure that it's included uh, appropriately. And so, so I, I mean, I'm very, I'm very in tune with like, you know, what the lawyer side would be, but, here I am having trouble <laughs> getting clients, right? <laughs> and it's just like, ultimately, this is supposed to be a document that's, that's supposed to facilitate a business arrangement, not impede it, right? So, so yeah, I, I have so much more to just kind of iron out. Well, what I suggest is, you know, do what I did and make friends with lawyers because I have a, a friend, Daniel Abraham, and I don't know if Phil's ever met Daniel. Did you meet not, him? not personally, but I might have been on a phone conference with him. And uh, I've known Daniel. Daniel used to be a volunteer with the Graphic Artist Guild way back when. Okay. And uh, he did a lot of legal work for them. As a matter of fact, he was uh, on the team that stood up before the Supreme uh, Court for uh, uh, Tassini versus New York Times. And uh, so he and I love talking about contracts. Yeah, they have a, they have, you should see, go to Mark's uh, YouTube page. They have a playlist of it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. He and I have, uh, 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 we did uh, several diff uh, chats about copyright and contracting and things. And it's called Law and Artist. And... Uh, I'd be doing with that with him still, but uh, he kind of a bit of a luddite on Facebook. And I was saying that, you know, it wasn't going to do us any good if he wasn't on Facebook so that he could start promoting for both of us. And it's been like a year. And he still hasn't gotten uh, himself social media acclimatized yet. I wouldn't mind doing a podcast with them instead of a video thing. But uh, last time I talked to him, he was busy trying to figure out how to do his, uh, he teaches law. And he was trying to figure out how to 
do all his online curriculum via Zoom and he hates that, you know, he, he hates the format. But hey, he's uh, absolutely brilliant for talking about topics and he loves talking about it from the artist's point of view and he understands copyright law very thoroughly. And there's a lot of lawyers out there who, who only vaguely understand copyright law because it's not their uh, major, they just don't deal with I, IT as much as other people. And I've yet to find another lawyer that's uh, as knowledgeable as he is. Hmm. Yeah, I've always, I've always just been wary of, of like, you know, the legalese and everything. And I, I, I don't know, I, I assume that I reflect the, the same kind of uh, hesitation other people have where they look at a legal document and they think, oh, where's the gotcha? You know, where, where is that, that part that uh, if I don't understand well enough, I'm going to get screwed later on. And, and, and so, yeah, I, I definitely, I, I definitely like being well versed in contracts, but a lot of it is based, you know, mainly on anxiety, right? Like I, I got to cover my own ass and I got to, I got to be ready to, to spot the, the pitfalls and all that stuff. So it, it's not something I think of as fun, you know, it, and, uh, it, and then lately on the other side of things, like I, I see it as almost like a protection, right? Like a, a, a thing that makes sure that if, if things do go bad, I'm protected, you know, not, not necessarily, uh, the client, but you know, obviously it should protect both of us. But but it seems like that's when you get those boilerplates and things like that. It seems like they're always very one sided, right? And, and in some ways, I look at my own contract. I'm like, you know, this this does probably a lot more for me than other clients are willing to let happen. But but I say that based on my very limited experience. Um, my I I had a. Uh, a potential project with a university and uh and it was only r recently that i found out from somebody in the uh, uh the industry that universities are, are just really difficult to work with um but but i was optimistic at the time and then uh they took a look at my my agreement and they they, they had the back and forth where they wanted to change this and that and and it took it took longer than i would have liked to to get it done and I thought it was all wrapped up. And then they came back to me and it was like, oh, by the way, we have a master contract that your, your agreement has to also fall under. Uh, so here it is. You can take a look at it and let me know if you have any questions. And this thing was just a monster that would have completely negated my contract. Like I, w I was signing over like intellectual property rights, uh, like all of mine, not, not just the ones that I would develop under the project, but the ones that I had, you know, from before and everything like i was giving free license to all of that trade uh or what's the word um uh trade craft i can't i can't remember the word but uh trade secrets excuse me like just all of that stuff and then i was like well you know this is basically a work for hire agreement but i haven't been negotiating with them under work for hire terms so so there I was and I was like, well, I, I could do this, but I'd have to charge them like twice as much because they're, they're taking everything. I don't even have the right to put it on my portfolio or, right. or, or say that they're my client. And I was like, you know, I need to charge you more for this. And, and by then I was like, we, we should have gotten started on this project a couple of days ago. You know, I, I'm not prepared to, to take on, you know, further negotiations for this contract because basically I have to double the price on you. So I was, I just stepped away. Uh, I felt super bad about it too, but, but yeah, that's my experience. It's like, you know, you get, you get their contract and you're getting plowed under and, and really it's just like you, you have to start with your contract and kind of work back from there. Kind of, kind of the same way as it is with negotiating the rate, right? Like you don't start low and then work your way high. Uh, you start high and then work your way low. Uh, and, and it's kind of the same with the contract. To be honest, I, I wouldn't mind an agent just doing all this for me, though. It's 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 not fun. 
I used to have an art rep named Susan Trimpey, and she was really good. And she and I would talk about contracts and, and uh, pricing and everything. And, uh, and I was, and she loved talking about that to me because I'm really good at figuring out what my, pr figuring out prices. We, uh, there was a, a local group called the Society of Professional Graphic Artists, and we used to play this game at every luncheon called uh, Show and Price, where you would, you would stand up, show a project you were working on, uh, describe it, spend five minutes describing it. Uh, people would take about five minutes asking you about it, technical questions, and then they would start bidding on the project, how much they would have paid to do that project. And then at the end of it, you have to tell them the actual price you got. Yeah, we did that once with the Graphic Artist Guild. That was a lot yeah, of fun. They, I can't remember when, when that was. It seemed like it was a while ago now. Uh, yeah, the Graphic Artist Guild does something called the pricing game, but the bill, when did um, James Stowe said he was going to do another pricing game? Oh, I remember him saying it. It's uh, sometime next month, I think. I'd have to check the schedule. So, yeah, Ian, that would be one to go to. Yeah, I, I found that really, really enlightening. <sighs> but oh, yeah, well. I used to go, I loved that group. We would do that every single month. It was the whole, re one of the reasons I went to that, uh, the SBJ, all the guys in there were old school. They had been working as freelancers, you know, right after World War II. And they had basically set all the new standards. Like they got rid of work for hire in the Seattle area and got all the agencies basically used to not doing work for hire and not doing work on spec. People used to do work on spec all the time. It was a, uh, terrible god i would have loved to to work during that time i mean it seems like that's all kind of coming back now and so there were all these great artists in town too uh william dunning um bill Wer Ber werbeck was in charge of this uh he was one of the founders of the group uh matter of fact He's still alive. He's 95 years old and still painting. Uh, he's the guy who gave you the uh, gave you that book. Yeah, here it is. Uh, he uh, wrote his entire uh, life history, and it includes a compilation of all of his professional and uh, fine artwork. So, really, uh, he did. All the uh, 1962 World Fair stuff. There's a local restaurant chain here called uh, Ivers. Mm -hmm. And he did all of Ivers stuff. Oh, here's a page of some of his logo work. Oh. I'll see if I can find some of his illustration work. His illustration work has this very, it's a very mod 60s look. Let's see if I can find. Uh... Just FYI, we got about three minutes left. Oh, okay. So this is the type of stuff that he was doing. Oh. His, he'll, he does sort of like a, a uh, acrylic pastel type painting style. Uh, well, thank, I want to thank you guys for joining us for Epic Sketch Time. 
if you can, uh, if you like this video and what you heard, and if you'd like to participate and actually do uh, some more screen sharing, we did very little screen sharing this week. Mm -hmm. uh, you can join us every uh, Tuesday at 4.30. Get on our mailing list, follow the link in the doobly-doo down below. You can also follow us on uh, Epic Sketch Time on Facebook. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. Thank yep. you, Ian. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Yep. Have a good one.